Chapter 42 of Our Vanishing Wildlife. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shirtigal. Our Vanishing Wildlife by William T. Hornaday. Chapter 42 The Ethics of Sportsmanship. I count it as rather strange that American and English sportsmen have hunted and shot for a century, and until 1908 formulated practically nothing to establish and define the ethics of shooting game. Here and there a few unwritten principles have been evolved, and have become fixed by common consent, but the total number of these is very few. Perhaps this has been for the reason that every free and independent sportsman prefers to be a law unto himself. Is it not doubly strange, however, that even down to the present year, the term sportsman never has been defined by a sportsman? Forty years ago, a sportsman might have been defined, according to the standards of that period, as a man who hunts wild game for pleasure. Those were the days wherein no one foresaw the wholesale annihilation of species, and there were no wilderness game preserves. In those days, gentlemen shot female hoofed game, trapped bears if they felt like it, killed ten times as much big game as they could use, and no one made any fuss whatever about the waste or extermination of wild life. Those were the days of ox teams and broad axes. Today, we are living in a totally different world, a world of grinding, crunching, pulverizing progress, a world of annihilation of the works of nature. And what is a sportsman today? A sportsman is a man who loves nature, and who, in the enjoyment of the outdoor life and exploration, takes a reasonable toll of nature's wild animals, but not for commercial profit, and only so long as his hunting does not promote the extermination of a species. In view of the disappearance of wild life all over the habitable globe, and the steady extermination of species, the ethics of sportsmanship has become a matter of tremendous importance. If a man can shoot the last living birchal zebra or pronghorned antelope and be a sportsman and a gentleman, then we may as well drop down all bars and say no more about the ethics of shooting game. But the real gentlemen sportsmen of the world are not insensible to the duties of the hour in regard to the taking of, or not taking of game. The time has come when canon laws should be laid down of world-wide application, and so thoroughly accepted and promulgated that their binding force cannot be ignored. Among other things, it is time for a list of species to be published which no man claiming to be either a gentleman or a sportsman can shoot for aught else than preservation in a public museum. Of course, this list would be composed of the species that are threatened with extermination. Of American animals, it should include the pronghorned antelope, Mexican mountain sheep, all the mountain sheep and goats in the United States, the California grizzly bear, mule deer, West Indian seal and California elephant seal and walrus. In Africa, that list should include the eland, white rhinoceroses, blessbok, bontbok, kudu, giraffes and southern elephants, sable antelope, rhinoceroses south of the Zambezi, Lyricorex antelope, and whale-headed stork. In Asia, it should include the great Indian rhinoceroses and its allied species, the burl, the Nilgiri tar, and the gale. The David deer of Manchuria already is extinct in a wild state. In Australia, the interdiction should include the thylacine or Tasmanian wolf, all the large kangaroos, the emu, the lyre bird, and the mallee bird. Think what it would mean to the species named above if all the sportsmen of the world would unite in their defense, both actively and passively. It would be to those species a modus vivendi worthwhile. Prior to 1908, no effort, so far as we are aware, ever had been made to promote the establishment of a comprehensive and up-to-date code of ethics for sportsmen who shoot. A few clubs of men who are hunters of big game had expressed in their constitutions a few brief principles for the purpose of standardizing their own respective memberships, but that was all. I have not taken pains to make a general canvas of sportsmen's clubs to ascertain 
what rules have been laid down by any large number of organizations. The Boone Crockett Club of New York and Washington had in its constitution the following excellent article. Article 10. The use of steel traps, the making of large bags, the killing of game while swimming in water, or helpless in deep snow, and the unnecessary killing of females or young of any species of ruminant shall be deemed offenses. Any member who shall commit such offenses may be suspended or expelled from the club by a unanimous vote of the executive committee. In 1906, this club condemned the use of automatic shotguns in hunting as unsportsmanlike. The Lewis and Clark Club of Pittsburgh had in its constitution, as Section 3 of Article 3, the following comprehensive principle. The term legitimate sport means not only the observance of local laws, but excludes all methods of taking game other than by fair stalking or still hunting. At the end of the constitution of this club is this declaration and admonition. Purchase and sale of trophies. As the purchase of heads and horns establishes a market value and encourages Indians and others to shoot for sale, often in violation of local laws and always through the detriment of the protection of game for legitimate sport, the Lewis and Clark Club condemns the purchase or the sale of the heads or horns of any game. In 1906, the Lewis and Clark Club condemned the use of automatic shotguns as unsportsmanlike. The Shikar Club of London, a club which contains all the big game hunters of the nobility and gentry of England, and of which His Majesty King George is honorary president, has declared the leading feature of its objects in the following terms. To maintain the standard of sportsmanship, it is not squandered bullets in swollen bags which appeal to us. The test is rather in a love of forest, mountains, and desert, in acquired knowledge of the habits of animals, in the strenuous pursuit of a wary and dangerous quarry, in the instinct for well-devised approach to a fair shooting distance, and in the patient retrieve of wounded animal. In 1908, the Campfire Club of America formally adopted as its code of ethics the Sportsman's Platform of 15 articles that was prepared by the writer and placed before the sportsmen of America, Great Britain, and her colonial dependencies in that year. In the book of the club, it regularly appears as follows. Code of Ethics of the Campfire Club of America Proposed by William T. Hornaday and adopted December 10, 1908 1. The wild animal life of today is not ours to do with as we please. The original stock is given to us in trust for the benefit both of the present and the future. We must render an accounting of this trust to those who come after us. 2. Judging from the rate at which the wild creatures of North America are now being destroyed, fifty years hence there will be no large game left in the United States nor in Canada outside of rigidly protected game preserves. It is therefore the duty of every good citizen to promote the protection of forests and wildlife and the creation of game preserves while supply of game remains. Every man who finds pleasure in hunting or fishing should be willing to spend both time and money in active work for the protection of forests, fish, and game. 3. The sale of game is incompatible with the perpetual preservation of a proper stock of game, Therefore, it should be prohibited by laws and by public sentiment. 4. In the settled and civilized regions of North America, there is no real necessity for the consumption of wild game as human food, nor is there any good excuse for the sale of game for food purposes. The maintenance of hired laborers on wild game should be prohibited everywhere under severe penalties. 5. An Indian has no more right to kill wild game, or to subsist upon it all year round, than any white man in the same locality. The Indian has no inherent or God-given ownership of the game in North America, any more than of its mineral resources, and he should be governed by the same game laws as white men. 6. No man can be a good citizen and also be a slaughterer of game or fishes 
beyond the narrow limits compatible with high-class sportsmanship. 7. A game butcher or market hunter is an undesirable citizen and should be treated as such. 8. The highest purpose which the killing of wild game and game fishes can hereafter be made to serve is in furnishing objects to overworked men for tramping and camping trips in the wilds, and the value of wild game as human food should no longer be regarded as an important factor in its pursuit. 9. If rightly conserved, wild game constitutes a valuable asset to any country which possesses it, and it is good statesmanship to protect it. 10. An ideal hunting trip consists of a good comrade, fine country, and a very few trophies per hunter. 11. In an ideal hunting trip, the death of the game is only by an incident, and by no means is it really necessary to a successful outing. 12. The best hunter is the man who finds the most game, kills the least, and leaves behind him no wounded animals. 13. The killing of an animal means the end of its most interesting period. When the country is fine, pursuit is more interesting than possession. 14. The killing of a female hoofed animal, save for special preservation, is to be regarded as incompatible with the highest sportsmanship, and it should everywhere be prohibited by stringent laws. 15. A particularly fine photograph of a large wild animal in its haunts is entitled to more credit than the dead trophy of a similar animal. An animal that has been photographed never should be killed unless previously wounded in the chase. This platform has been adopted as a code of ethics by the following organizations, besides the Campfire Club of America. The Lewis and Clark Club of Pittsburgh, John M. Phillips, President, the North American Fish and Game Protective Association, International, the Massachusetts Fish and Game Protective Association, Boston, Campfire Club of Michigan, Detroit, Rod and Gun Club, Sheridan County, Wyoming. The platform has been endorsed and published by the Society for the Preservation of the Wild Fauna of the British Empire, London, which is an endorsement of far-reaching importance. Major J. Stevenson Hamilton, CMZS, Warden of the Government Game Reserves of the Transvaal, South Africa, has adopted the platform and given it the most effective endorsement that it has received from any single individual. In his great work on game protection in Africa and wild animal lore, entitled Animal Life in Africa, and very highly commended by the Committee on Literary Honors of the Campfire Club, he publishes the entire platform, with a depth and cordiality of endorsement that is bound to warm the heart of every man who believes in the principles laid down in that document. He says, It should be printed on the back of every license that is issued for hunting in Africa. I am profoundly impressed by the fact that it is high time for sportsmen all over the world to take to heart the vital necessity of adopting high and clearly defined codes of ethics to suit the needs of the present hour. The days of game abundance and the careless treatment of wildlife have gone, never to return. End of chapter 42, The Ethics of Sportsmanship